Thank you very much. No, I'm delighted to be here again. Um, well, I've got two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. Um, well, there will be lots of things Ramesh has covered already. You will just now have to listen to that in French. <laughs> but uh, no, histology is definitely not boring. Pathology is definitely not boring. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's even less and more and more interesting since we moved to new supplementary techniques on the top of dealing with, uh, sorry to say, but some sort of fresh meat looking specimens up to the very deep inside DNA, RNA level of expression. So we cover the whole range and we are still medical doctors and we go to MDT meetings like Ramesh kindly uh, reminded and we are really full part of the team and we learn a lot and I think our input is helpful. So it's very lively. I don't, uh, 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 sorry, speciality, I don't spend the whole day under the microscope in a dark room. It's much more uh, interesting and I can also go to meetings like this today. So again, histology diagnosis, so uh, I will focus on mutation testing, the how we do it, what can it be done, uh, how can it be, the delay, the rate of failure, those sort of things. So I'm going to focus on that mainly, but just I wanted to highlight that actually is supplementary to the histology diagnosis Ramesh discussed extensively. And actually there are lots of uh, types of specimens we can uh, play with, if I say, and more and more the specimens are smaller and smaller. <laughs> and we've been asked to say more and more from s less and less, basically, which is fascinating. Um, which it used to be that uh, we thought we can only make a diagnosis in specimens which were, again, kilograms in weight and, and, uh, and well-preserved and everything. And now it happens like from few cells which can be taken with modern techniques in a non-aggressive way, which is better for the patients, thanks to radiologists who are absolutely fantastic and very brave people, can go through any other sort of organ to put a needle and aspirate some cells for us. We can process in a, in a modern way and get so much information out of it, uh, typing the lesion, confirming is the tumor first, typing the tumor, not everything is a gist of course, and from that typing the gist by um, uh, some uh, grading it, grade means how aggressive it can be according to how cells fight each other, it's mitosis and atypia necrosis, and also again get the mutation testing done from those very small specimens, which means uh, it helps when we go to MDT meetings, the oncologists, the surgeons, to know what they're dealing with and how the patient would be best managed um, with uh, all this information we can provide, and especially the mutation, which is today's topic. Uh, if the tumor is big or in a location, a site which is dangerous for having surgery, could be delivering aggressive surgery. If you have the mutation, formation of mutation, which give, it tells you if the tumor is likely to respond to imatinib or sunitinib or other drugs, is it the worst downsizing the tumor, and uh, which eventually would be resected with less arm and less damage secondary. So it's very important, and we can do that. We do that every day. <laughs> Uh, that's what it looks like, <laughs> a tumor in reality. Uh, this is a very typical gist from stomach, the, 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 the very uh, typical gist again, uh, and fresh when it comes directly to the theater. It's very important that we get them fresh, as uh, uh, we mentioned, because we can freeze a bit in nitrogen, and that is we don't need that for the diagnosis currently, but for further research projects, uh, frozen, freezing the tissue preserves it very much m better than putting in formalin for further processing for histology. Which means it can be, uh, lots of um, more sophisticated technologies can be applied, not cell culture, it's a bit too late, but other things, and um, whole genome sequencing, for example, and, and so things. So we, we bank, we have biobanks in the country, as it's going to be uh, discussed extensively in the afternoon, understand, and so uh, we, our surgeons are very helpful and they know that we like them and uh, to be honest any type of tumor should come down fresh to our histology department. We freeze, not, we don't need hundreds of uh, uh, kilograms again freezing, we put in nitrogen and that is banked and it's available for the community. The bank is centralized and that tissue can travel all around the, the world if it's needed for further projects including in the states as long as we have uh, ethical approval for that. So that's very important. 
So the tumors can be very big, which doesn't mean that they're necessarily much more aggressive, but they, because actually when such a big tumor is still in the body, I would say it's probably a, a, a slow-growing tumor, which is not that aggressive, because the patient can, could have surgery still, which means the tumor was resectable disp despite its large size. So it is not necessarily a pejorative uh, feature. And histologically, which means after we process the specimen, we embed it half in, we cut sections, like what it looks like, it's very typical. You get on the, uh, maybe I can use the arrow here. No, yes. This is the gastric mucosa, which means the lumen of the stomach will be here. And that proliferation is there, deeper in the wall. And that is typical of GIST, but we confirm by even histochemistry. And in the cells, uh, in GIST are mainly of two types, they're spindly or larger and what we call epithelioid, which means they look like epithelial cells from an epithelium, but they are not. And again, as Ramesh said, now we get great help from the immunohistochemistry. Dog one has definitely made a change because kit was not specific enough and sensitive enough, which means there are tumors which are not GIST. We can have kit expression, not specific. And we have proper gists we do, which do not express kit, so it's not sensitive enough. Dog has sorted everything, is specific and sensitive. So which means we do less immunostains to preserve the material. Sick it and dog one, if it looks like a gist, if both are positive, it's enough for me to make a diagnosis and I don't do any further immunos. If it's not that straightforward, we can expand the immuno panel to other markers. And actually on the slides, when the positivity means that with the antibody we use has recognized the antigen, the protein is there, and we amplify the signal, technically it's very routine process, uh, practice in our department, and it looks brownish. It could look blauish, <laughs> or reddish or whatever, but it looks brownish by convention because of the enzymes we use. So on the top right is a very uh, typical gist strongly expressing either dog one or sekita I can't say from that, I need to know what antibody was applied to the slide. And I put that slide because that's what we see when we have tumors following imatinib treatment and being resected, which means it looks very much less cellular. There are much less brown dots here because there are less cells. The tumor has responded better and that's what it looks like in practice. So again, the specimens can be smaller and smaller. This is a gastric biopsy, which we can make a diagnosis <coughs> very accurately, including uh, the mutation testing. This is again a tumor which expresses in a small biopsy, endoscopic biopsy, kit. And the cytology specimen, actually at least we agree, Ramesh and I, because this is, <laughs> he showed exactly the same, slide, same sort. One is from Cambridge, the other one from Birmingham. But uh, it's very similar, very tiny, tiny specimens, uh, again assessed, um, sorry, taken through what we call a co-endoscopy by a radiologist, which is very, uh, very high quality specimen, which can uh, be used for all the range of techniques. Testing, mutation. Well, it has become a routine test. It has to be regarded as a routine test. It has to be regarded as widely available and feasible. Uh, we've been doing that uh, since 2004 and five. routine 2006 here. And we started in France in, 90, <laughs> in um, 2002, sorry. And actually, um, it's not mandatory, as Ramesh said, but it's highly recommended in practice if you talk to any uh, specialist, physician or s surgeon specialized in GIST, they all say that m mutation has to be done. There's no doubt, and they will not manage a patient with GIST without having this information. So, um, again, something from my point of view as a molecular pathologist, any type of specimen is in theory suitable for the testing cytology if has been processed accurately, uh, biopsy, resection specimen, paraffin embedded, that everything works with the technique we apply. And it gives you three types of information, the mutation testing, as previously said. It helps confirming a diagnosis of uh, something which looks like gist, which can smell like gist, but not fully straightforward. So it's an add-on. 
uh, which means you have GIST, which we it's not very true anymore since we have DOG1, which is extremely uh, sensitive and specific, as I said. But if you have something, well, we're not doing the mutation to help in the diagnosis. And even if it's not a GIST after all, if it has a mutation, there is a treatment suitable. We lie to the, the commissioners uh, and patient could benefit from, it, <laughs> from imatinib. <laughs> It could be a gist where you will not expect seeing a gist. Ramesh mentioned about pelvic tumors, or we have gists which are only seen in liver with no known primary, and by definition, a gastrointestinal tumor with no gastrointestinal uh, location is a bit strange, but it happens in practice. We all have a few cases of those, so actually, um, we can, uh, it can help in confirming a diagnosis, and again, if there is a mutation, um, open some opportunities for the treatment or something which again doesn't look like gist, doesn't smell like gist, but would love that to be gist. <laughs> In usual morphology, so we do the testing. It has to be seen as something cheap, easy to do, routine, and not a big deal, really. And after that, you can play with. Uh, the prognosis that was raised, actually, again, is not on very much use in practice, as Ramesh said, but we know that some mutations in either of the two genes we test routinely can have some prognostic value, which means can tell you about how aggressive the tumor would behave if you were not treating it, but it's not what we do, we treat patients, do we? Not. Um, exon 9 and KIT are known to be more aggressive tumors, and probably explanation why the intestinal gist are known to be slightly more aggressive than the gastric one, because this mutation is seen almost exclusively in the intestinal gist and almost never in gastric gists. And the other way around, this mutation, which is famous mutation for something else, the D842, which is in exon 18 of PG alpha gene, almost exclusively seen in stomach, is known to convey less aggressive behavior to the tumor, which means that all tumors, which can be very big with no metastasis, still resectable and slow growing. For the third area, which is the most important, is prediction to specific treatment, really. So we know that the mutations in exon 11 have a convey good response to imatinib, definitely. The missense mutations are better than deletions, but it doesn't matter very much, they all do. And those mutations in exon 9, actually, uh, which are again in the prognostic area, are known to need to probably respond less well uh, to imatinib and sometimes requiring double dose to get the same uh, advantage. Um, but in, this, um, in the UK, it's complicated to have double dose, but in other countries, actually, imatinib is uh, licensed for uh, being started at 800 milligrams when the tumor shows this mutation. And that mutation, which is a good mutation in terms of natural history, is actually a bad mutation to have if you need imatinib. Uh, because it conveys primary resistance not only to imatinib but to sunitinib, unfortunately. But in practice, it seems to me, again, Ramesh would be better, or David Peake, to say that this is mutations of good prognosis. It's rarely that we have in this situation with a tumor with that mutation, we require imatinib because surgery may be enough. But that's the paradox. So actually, uh, all the mutation testing gives you lots of information. So it's not magic, it works in a lab like mine. Um, when we want to do a mutation analysis, we need to know what we have to target. And a gene comp is very long gene, uh, comprises comprising lots of exons, which are the coding part. So we know that the mutations are not everywhere in these two genes, KIT and PG-alpha, but are in mainly seven exons in total, which means four exons in um, in KIT and three in PG alpha. So we analyzed only there the exon 8, which again uh, uh, Ramesh s said a few words, it's just very rarely mutated, so it's not part of the routine panel. It's only when we can't find mutation we do that. So we do that, and how do we do? Well, we scrape the metal from the sections, <laughs> basically. It's just, uh, you know, with a, with a knife, you get <laughs> we from the, the glass lines. We look at where the tumor is, that's where the tumor is. You just remove it from further sections. These are what we call sections cut from a, a, a paraffin block. A paraffin block is cut on a microtome, which is again the same principle of slicing ham of sausages, but it's like thinner. But that's exactly the same principle, really. 
and uh, and actually you do uh, you make it in a cocktail which uh, releases DNA from the cells. You amplify PCA with specific what we call primers, because you amplify what we want to amplify, you select the part of DNA you want to amplify. This is why it looks a machine. <laughs> so this machine is 20 years old, we have a bit, but uh, we have seven or eight of those in our lab. It looks much, much more, uh, much posher, I would say. And the second thing is a sequencing machine, which is a noisy thing, but which does the job. And actually, after that, you have to interpret the results. Doesn't The machine doesn't speak to us as such. Um, it shows that uh, these colorful uh, um, things, which are actually base by base, DNA, is, so there's a four base, G, C, T, A. Each one has a, co a color, which is, of course, a code. And actually, we look at uh, that what is in the tumor compared to what we know the normal sequence would be. That how we said there is the mutation. It's like in pathology, mutation is different to where it should be normally. So we look at differences. And here, for that case, the difference lies here when you have a red and a blue in the middle altogether, where you should have a near red. So it says that there is a mutation. You know what codon it corresponds to, and that's how you type the mutation, we type the mutation. This one is a called a missense. Uh, if it's a more complex mutation, it's a deletion. Or even a more complex mutation, again, a large deletion. And in exon 11, you can have very large, large mutations, sometimes difficult to type, and, uh, but that requires some expertise. But our report not only says there is a mutation, but types it precisely according to the nomenclature and actually, that's really a requirement for accreditation and quality control schemes and everything. We have a new toy, thanks to CARGEN with the companion diagnostics, which allows us to test, even if there are very mystery cells floating in blood, <laughs> highly sensitive, but targets only two mutations, especially the D8442, um, sorry, in exon 18, which means when specimens are very, very small, which happens. At least we can say, by using this technique, the other technique I mentioned earlier requires more DNA, actually, uh, than that one. So it means we have still specimens which are very too scanty, which fail for detection. And that one works in everything, and at least we can say there is, or there is not an 842, which is the only mutation conveys um, uh, uh, resistance, primary resistance to treatment. So the assumption if, if that is a gist, but th there is not with the mutation which is not that one, it is assumed that the tumor will respond to imatinib. So it helps in rescuing, if you wish, few cases and in, in patients who really need an urgent treatment to be started on. So how we do? We test all the tumors uh, which come to our hospital and we are lucky enough to receive cases from outside, including uh, Ken Ramesh's tumors, which I like. <laughs> and we've done so far, uh, actually successful tests, yeah, I've audited that recently, about less than 1,100 tumors in the last uh, eight years. And, uh, and this was successfully tested. The rate of failure, which I should have mentioned that, is about 8%, which means 8% of specimens we receive, we didn't manage to get DNA. Uh, for various reasons, most of the time because they are too scanty. And most of the gist are mutated, which is not a surprise, 85%. Most of the mutations are in kit compared to PG alpha, 87%. And uh, most of the mutations are in exon 11 of kit, which is again as published uh, everywhere, to be honest, which means exon 11 is from far the most commonly mutated exon among the two genes. And this rare mutation, which again is important for the treatment, is relatively rare, but not that rare. It's 8% of all the mutations, so it's worth looking for it because it has implications for the management. This exon 9 mutation is very rare, and the other is a variety of other very, very anecdotal mutations, but or most of them um, are good and convey good uh, um, response to imatinib anyway. So, these are limitations. It's straightforward. The delay, 
it's not that quick, but it doesn't need to be quick because of the technology we use. For most of the other genes we test in other carcinomas like EGF uh, ALK, we, 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 uh, we are the technologies allows us to do it quicker. But since the mutations in exon 11 of KIT are very complex, we cannot go away from that direct sequencing technique because there is no way of targeting, which means it takes two to three weeks, sometimes less. It should take less. But in practice, we have to say three weeks. So now, if you can't find a mutation, that's always stressful for us. Is it because we were not good enough, we missed it? Or is it because we were not expecting, despite the fact the tumor is suggest, to find a mutation? So we're back to the clinics, and we know that there are various conditions where you can't expect finding a mutation Despite the fact it's a proper gist, there was no mistake in the diagnosis, our technology works, our quality control works, we haven't put the wrong specimen in the wrong tube and everything, no, we're not. So neurofibromatosis is one of those, you know, Carnes tried, Carnes Trataki syndrome, and there's still mysterious uh, gist, many in young females or females for which we don't have any molecular um, background known yet. So neurofibromatosis where it's a clinical diagnosis, you know, most of the time the diagnosis is made before the patient was diagnosed with a gist, but there are definitely proper gists among other tumors and neurofibromas, uh, the patients uh, and the skin lesion those patients present with, but the protein is overexpressed, which means they are expressed by immunohistochemistry kit, but this is not because of an underlying mutation at the gene level. The other expression is induced through another pathway, which is called MAP kinase pathway, which is very frequently altered in carcinomas as well. The kinase stride, you probably know me more than I do about it, is a lesion still in females exclusively with no inherited disorder, which means not a family, it's just what we call sporadic. And actually, it's an association, it's a clinical definition, and the patients have a pulmonary chondroma, which, is a, which are benign lesions in, the, in both uh, lungs, uh, gastric gists, uh, paragangliomas, which means tumor, which look like pheochromocytomas in adrenal glands, but extra adrenal glands. And it seems that there is a risk, an increased risk for other type of lesions, as we recently described, but it's a rare disorder. Molecular-wise, um, we don't know a lot. Uh, we know that the gists in the patients with carnestride will not uh, have a mutation in either KIT or PG-alpha genes, they, buy, but they, all ex they show most of them loss of expression of SDH, which again Ramesh described, and I have a few more slides about it, um, without having a germline mutation again, which is to, uh, again, to distinguish to Garnet Stratakis syndrome. But in practice, the cells in the gist with patients with Garnet Stratakis most often show loss of SDH expression, even if we don't know how it happens yet. Um, again, the Garnet Stratakis syndrome, which is again uh, the molecular background we know about it and how it's been uh, described is a germline mutation, inherited disorder then, um, in uh, one of the enzymes, part of this SDH system, which is a mitochondrial enzym enzymatic system. And for those patients having the clinically uh, diagnosed Carnestratakis syndrome with no mutations in the AGH, some of them had been described having a mutation in KIT gene. It's extremely uncommon. And again, there are many, the, the just includes the gist in pediatric patients, you know, uh, most of them still have a mutation in Kino P alpha, but some of them are not, because we back to the previous lines, they are neophobomatosis patients, they are carnes tried, they are from family with germline mutations, and Ramesh said that actually he doesn't know any <laughs> family in the UK, but there are some described in, in the world, definitely. Or it is sporadic, and in that case, it's back to the, to the gist, which are wild type for kit and pg alpha in females predominantly, could be uh, girls or uh, ladies, 
And actually, and those we do not know about the background, we know that they don't have alterations in KIDAT PG alpha and they don't have alterations in STH or either in a MAP kinase pathway. So again, that's to um, just put that to show off. I'm not able to uh, describe in detail the, the, the enzymatic system is very molecular wise how the system works. In practice, the SDH system has several subunits, A, B, C, D. And actually, what we can test in the uh, specimens that we see is just the expression of, by using specific antibodies, and we have antibodies recognizing B and A subtypes. And normally, the cells normally express this. So when it's abnormal, the cells which should normally express these proteins because it's part of the normal physiology of the cells do not express anymore. So we, have to, we look after loss, disparation, loss of expression. And uh, actually having an antibody working for SDHB is probably enough to cover everything in practice because you can't have alteration um, uh, in A, C, and D if B is preserved. For, so which means by having B, we at least highlight that there is a problem in the system. After that, more work needs to be done uh, Again, especially uh, um, the patients need to be referred to geneticists for family tree and uh, more molecular or germline investigation. But me in the tumor, I can at least say there is something wrong here. And in practice, all tumors, which I can't find any mutations in either of these KIT and PD alpha genes, I test them for SDH expression, which again helps for the management. I also test them for BRAF mutation, which is a gene involved in uh, many um, um, pathways for the cell division and everything. Um, that's very uncommon. So far, I haven't seen in my life one tumor which was BRAF mutated, but we do is part of the guidelines. So it's back of this definition of the quadruple or triple white type gist, again, that uh, again Ramesh clear, uh, quickly uh, alluded to earlier, which means what we call a white type once now, is probably another white type, so is when we say white type is we have no idea what the background is, no mutation in kit, no mutation in PG alpha, no alteration in SDH, no alteration in BRAF, and no neurofibromatosis, which is again the other pathway where tumors can be altered. So that's where we are now. Thank you. I think it's Thank you very much, Philippe. Well, <laughs>